Okay, can you guys hear me now? Excellent. All right. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm really happy to see everyone here. And I am really thrilled um, that we can bring a very special writer to talk to us. And for two reasons, or two main reasons. Um, one, because there is a book that has just come out which I think is of extraordinary importance. Um, and I am grateful that we can have the occasion to talk about it here. Um, and let me let me show you this first. Um, so this book just came out, the English translation just came out. It's called I Love Russia. The title in Russian is Moya Lubi Maya Strana. You can also reflect on that translation. Reporting from a lost country. Um, and it's an extraordinary book um, by an extraordinary writer. And let me tell you a little bit about the writer first. So this is Elena Kostuchenko. Um, and she, she was a young adolescent teenager who was captivated by the reporting of Anna Politkovskaya um, as a very young person and decided that she wanted to become a journalist and that kind of fearless investigative journalist um, in Putin's Russia. And as a very young person, she moved by herself as a teenager to Moscow to study journalism, wanting to work at Novaya Gazeta, where Anna Politkovskaya was writing. Um, and she managed to do all of this um, all on her own um, and began reporting um, as a young intern, still a teenager at Novaya Gazeta when Anna Politkovskaya was still alive. Um, and when Elena was just 19, Anna Politkovskaya was assassinated. Um, and Elena kind of fearlessly <laughs> um, and courageously kind of continued despite the fact that one journalist after another at Novaya Gazeta was the victim of an assassination attempt, be it successful or unsuccessful, kind of undeterred. She, with determination, traveled all around Russia as well as to other places, um, determined to tell the truth about a very big, very complicated country with a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, often living a very brutalized existence um, and understanding the world in ways that are often difficult to imagine without actually being right there with them. And she has a particular gift for showing up in places and persuading people to talk to her and to open their lives to her and to hand her their babies to deliver to a, a grandmother in another town. Um, and she listens to them. And the, the art of journalism as the art of being the person who listens to other people and who listens to the other people who are not writers and who are not intellectuals and who are not writing for themselves very much comes out in this book. She goes to all these places. It's amazing that she's still alive. There's one very harrowing story in this book about a long taxi ride that she takes in the middle of the night with a taxi driver from Tver that if we didn't know she had survived to write this book, um, you're waiting for it not to end very well at any given moment. Um, and But she, she listens to people and she listens to long, complicated stories. And she listens even when the stories don't seem to be making any sense at the beginning you know, and you're trying to understand how how people are surviving in very brutal circumstances, how they have understood situations that are absurdist, that are sadistic, that are cruel, that have been normalized. And she evokes their voices. You know, there's a lot of dialogue in this book, and you can hear these voices of these people coming out. Um, and it's it's a kind of masterpiece of the art of journalism and, you know, why why good journalism matters 
you know, and why telling the truth matters and why listening to people matters, why going outside of the metropolis, why going outside of the city matters. And that's especially urgent right now because Russia has become like a black box here. It's the first time in my adult life that nobody is going to Russia who I know, that it's dangerous to go into Russia, that, you know, even most of our journalists have been pulled, that we have very little access to what people are really thinking, you know, inside. And this has been the most revelatory thing um that that we have about how did this happen and and Elena is constantly asking this question in this book how did this happen you know how did this country turn into a fascist country how did totalitarianism rise again um in, in Russia and she's she's asking this with you know both an acutely critical sensibility mercilessly and with great love and with great sympathy, but with no excuses and with no apologetics. And that's a very, very difficult balance um, to achieve. And at the towards the, the end of this book, she she tells a very kind of heartbreaking story about February um, 2022. And Elena, for those of you who don't know, had been reporting on the war in the Donbass um, eight years ago, nine years ago now, from the beginning, she got the first serious interview with a Russian soldier in the Donbass in 2015, who admitted to being a Russian soldier. And it was extraordinary interview. Um, she finds him in the hospital in Donetsk when he's gruesomely wounded and he tells a story of how he got there. Um, and she's now telling the story of you know, February 24th, 2022, and she wakes up in, in the middle of, of the night and goes out to smoke. And she comes back to her room and her girlfriend, Yana, who is also a heroine of this story, is sitting on the bed looking at the phone um, and and looks up and says, we're, you know, that they're, they're bombing Kiev. You know, and Elena's like, we're bombing Kiev and Jan is like, yes, we are bombing Kiev. Um, and she gets stressed and she goes to the Novaya Gazeta office and they look at her and they say, Tiko Tova, you know, are you ready? And she says, no, konyechna gotova. Of course, I'm ready. And she she takes off for Ukraine. Um, and I will I will let her tell the rest of the story from there. But let me just I am I'm thrilled both that I'm thrilled I can introduce you to this book, which I think is of enormous importance, you know, and for various different reasons in different countries. But for us in America, it's extraordinarily important right now to help us understand what happened to Russia, what's going on in Russia. I am delighted to see Elena in person and alive, which was by no means a foregone conclusion. I am just so grateful that she could be here with us in person. And I'm very grateful to my colleagues. Now I have Andre Karajcik, um and, and Nari um, no, Shalak-Payev here, who um, Nari is a professor in the Slavic department. Um, he's from Kazakhstan and Andre is a visiting playwright from Belarus. They are both big fans of Elena's writing um, and wonderful interlocutors. So thank you to all of them. Um, I'm now gonna turn this over to Elena to say a few words of introduction and then I'm gonna let everyone be in conversation. Can I also say just a bit, uh, it's quite hard to speak after such kind introduction and I just wanted to express my gratitude for being here and I'm so happy to see you all and I'm really looking looking forward for like your questions and your comments and your thoughts because for me it's like the most valuable part of every meeting I have so thank you so so much for coming here with open hearts and open minds thank you thank you so much for these words uh for me, it's such a great honor to, to be here today on this talk. And I should say that uh, Elena is one of the most important anti-fascist uh, voices in the world right now, definitely. And uh, because so many people, and uh, I hope that it will be great discussion. I will make a few short questions. Uh, and the first is about the name of the book. Uh, I love Russia. So, you know, we are living in the time when a lot of people hate Russia, actually, mostly because of the uh, Vladimir Putin fascist policies uh, and aggressive wars. And it's like trend of canceling of, of Russia, Russian culture, uh, 
and and Russian context. So uh, my question is, what what should be loved in today's uh, Russia? Is it like still about uh, Pushkin, Berezka, vodka, and uh, samovar, or is it really something else where we can find to to love in in uh, today's uh, Putin's uh, Russia? You don't know. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I believe there is no re there is no need in reason for love. I mean, you just love something or you don't. And now for me, Russia is not Pushkin and Berezky, but Pushkin and Berezky too, of course. Uh, but for me, Russia is the community of people united with common destiny. And this feeling what I have, it mostly the feeling of belonging. I feel I belong to them and I feel they belong to me. And it's like to love your arm or leg not m many emotions about it, but if it hurts, it's only one thing you can think of. So now it's really hurts. So this love caused me a lot of pain, but it's not like I'm willing to deny it or to hide it specifically because Putin's propaganda using love of Russia as an excuse for crimes. What he says, basically, if you love Russia, go and kill Ukrainians. If you love Russia, obey. If you love Russia, be silent or lie if you need to. But the truth is that love doesn't demand lies, murder, obedience. It demands very precise look at what you love. And it demands responsibility. So I feel this responsibility and this is how my love expresses, I guess, though it's tough. And I believe specifically in the times like this, then politicians are so willing to explain us what should we feel and what these feelings demand us to do. We should know specifically what we are feeling, what we feel, like not them, but us. And I'm very happy that title of my book helps to start this conversation. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy uh, to, to welcome you at Yale. Um, uh, I think it's everyone here is really uh, happy and pleased. And thanks, Marcy. Marcy, Marcy made this marvelous introduction of the book. I started to read it. I never finished. I didn't have time, but uh, uh, I think it's a, uh, of what I read about 30%, uh, like 100 pages, it's a fantastic book. So I definitely um, kind of uh, joined Marcy in this enthusiasm. Uh, you know, um, I'm going to ask you um, uh, a question, which which is probably, which is about your trajectory as a journalist. Yeah, because you started uh, uh, your career Seven, it has been like 17 years, right? Like many years ago. And a couple of months ago, Yuri Dut released this very long, very intense interview with you. Yeah, and one of his statements, um, quote unquote, was that you your text in, in this many years documented, quote, how Russia gradually became what it is now. End of quote. And then, you know, you responded to Yuri Dut uh, in a very interesting way. So you said that basically uh, Russia did not be, be, didn't become what it is now, like recently in, in the last 15 years. It was already like this in the 1990s. Yeah, so kind of in terms of democracy, things started to go, to, to, to go uh, south in Russia like many years ago, even before Putin. Yeah, and this is a very important point to me. Um, perhaps debatable. And this is, I think, why your book makes a really important contribution. Because, you know, you wrote about uh, the stuff of COVID hospitals, you wrote about uh, Caucasus, you wrote about um, Ghana Sans, this, you know, people in the uh, in the natives in, in, uh, in the north of Russia, and many, many topics, you, you covered them. And your stories are always they have always been stories about specific people yeah in specific circumstances 
uh, wrote in a kind of laconic, almost emotionless way. So, and this is why, you know, I'm like, I, I guess I have two questions in this regard. My first question is like, what is your relationship with your own texts? Like, what has been your trajectory? How did you pick your protagonists? How did you sort of structure your own trajectory as a journalist? Or was it was there any trajectory? Was there any plan, any kind of scheme of things? Or like, did you, how did you like follow? <laughs> yeah, Thank thanks. you so much for the question. Uh, well, it's what the trajectory in journalism, it's what actually bothered me when I was very young because like we were taught in university that we have to like pick up our specialization and I didn't know like how and what should I pick up and uh, like how it's all happening, like how it appeared that you became like a Caucasus expert or a war journalist or whatever. So for me, I was just, the truth is, I was extremely lucky. So when I got into Nova Gazeta, they sent me to the best editor in Nova Gazeta. His name was Nukzar Kabavich Mikiladze, and I dedicate my book to him. Uh, he was a very special person in my life, not just because he taught me everything I knew uh, in journalism and everything, almost everything I know about Russian language, but also because, I don't know, he was probably the one of the best people I ever met. And his own story is very tragic, actually. Uh, he's Georgian. So he, before Nova Gazeta, he was working uh, in Komsomolska Pravda in Georgia in late Soviet times. And then you probably heard what happened in 1989 then like Soviet soldiers start to basically kill people protesting against Moscow and in very brutal way. And he was there and he made his reportage about it. And this reportage wasn't published because of the censorship. And after that, he just couldn't stay to live in Belize because people saw him there and they knew that he must have talked about it. But he didn't have an opportunity to do it. So he left this place, he moved to Moscow, and he stopped writing, basically, almost suddenly. He, But he was willing to taught us what he, about what he knows and what he experienced. And so... I became his trainee and later I became a staff member of his department. This department called Group of Reporters and it was like a, a special task, task force inside Nova Gazeta. So if something really crazy happens like war, revolution, mass protests, mass murders, uh, ecological disaster uh, and like any kind of disaster, we were sent there. But thanks God, these events doesn't happen every day. Uh, so I had some free time and I used my free time for writing about people who, ne uh, who never been written about. So we call them invisible communities. It's like people who are out of media site constantly and there are very different reasons for that. And also I was writing about places and small towns and villages, which are also usually out of media sites. Russia is extremely underreported country. Putin started to gain control on the Russian media right from his first president term. And these layers of controls are extreme. And we have like whole regions of Russia. We don't really know what's happening there. And I'm realizing, I, I mean, I realized quite soon that me or even me and my colleagues or any other journalist, we are not able to like dramatically change it. But for me about journalism, 
I didn't believe like in uh, some high purpose of journalism, but I believe that journalism can create these invisible connections between people. And though like Nagana Sons you mentioned, the Northern Stripes in the continent who are basically dying out with just seven hundreds of them and in twenty years it's gonna be none or like women recruited into prostitution, uh, children living in abandoned hospital, or woman who's looking for the body of her husband who was killed in Donbass, and Russia denies both war, both husband's existence, both that his body is present. I just wanted these people not to be alone and be heard and be listened to. And I believe that to understand these people is actually more important than to understand Putin, because Putin, after all, he's just one lonely old man who's gonna die one way or another. These people, I just want that my readers would know about these people, would care about these people. And I believe these connections, which is being created at the connections who make us, like it, inside Russia, it can make us a nation, but like if in the world matter, these connections actually make the world place where we all can live. So, I believe about the trajectory. I was doing quite the same thing for 17 years. And I would really love to continue to do just the same thing for the rest of my life, I guess. My thank you very much for this for for this answer. And actually my question is somehow uh connected to it. Uh now, what we see in the world is the increasing of of uh, the uh, humanization. There is a terrible Russian word, расчеловечивание. Yeah, you know when when people uh, started to just uh, make another side uh, uh, to to look at this in inhumane way, like Russians called. The Ukrainians, Hachli, I don't know, uh, Ukri, uh, uh, Ukranazi, and uh, Ukrainians now use German orcs or 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 uh, under the law write the name of Russia with small letter, not capital letter, and oh, we see this in uh, in Israeli Palestine conflict and and any others. This terrible, terrible wave of de uh, humanization among people so you you uh, you uh, wrote the book where you put a lot of love and i remember one scene from this book about your childhood when you uh, when you tell the story about the games children games and in in soviet union and i remember it by myself we played like partisans against fascists all the time and you you, you as well had this episode uh, so it started in, in, in childhood. And uh, my question is, is it really possible to, to change this trend on total dehumanization of different sides, of very different conflicts? And uh, part of this question, what is fascism for you right now? Thank you so much for your question. I mean, I believe it's all essential. So I believe that the humanization we see now, it's like some kind of protective mechanism we all have. Then we bring, when they were brought into the city, when we are brought into the situation, then we need to kill another human being. You cannot just believe that another human is as valuable as you are, another person is as valuable as you are, as alive as you are as loving and loved as you are, and then just kill him or her. So then people 
are in war, they stop seeing people in each other. And is it natural, totally? Do we need to tolerate it? No, but the key thing is war. We shouldn't tolerate war. And war is very related to the language we use. War is very related to the narrative we grew up into. I keep thinking about it since like my first war in Donbass, but for the last two years I'm thinking about it obsessively. The way media, literature, art in general presents war, present war is is the reason why we keep tolerating it and it's the reason why we keep reproducing it. There's so many false narratives, like heroic narratives, like narratives of, you know, the great meaning of war. I've been in war, there is no meaning in that. There is no heroes in that. It's just people killing and dying and it's all what's happening there. The rest of this is just excuses for continuation. And you know, I see it more like a black hole which keeps gathering lives like a meat grinder with live people in it and people keep falling and it's very important for writers for people who try to understand what's happening not to get energy into this hole but take energy out of his hole but it's very hard to find the way to do it um uh, before this full-scale uh, full invasion had started, I tried to talk about it with my colleagues and most of them actually didn't understand me. Some of them understood me, but they say it's not the thing that journalists should be uh, concerned about. They just should be concerned about, you know, writing true facts, not writing false facts, and that's it. But... The words we choose for that, the way we choose for narrative, I mean, it's essential. And now I'm very lucky to have some people around me who are thinking about just the same thing. And probably, I'm, I'm, I don't have illusion that we came up to some brilliant solution, but probably we can make some progress there. And about fascism. Well... Fascism in Russia is quite textbook fascism. There is some minor changes, like this nationalistic component is not so vividly present as in Germany, for example, like Hitler's Germany. Uh, but, I mean, it has explanation because Russia is a multinational cult uh, country, a multicultural nation, like we have like so many people different people, different languages into our country. And we can't hold these territories without denying these people existence. I mean, the denial is happening, but it's going really slow, like with Afghanistan's. Then they losing their language, losing their culture, losing their way of living, and then just basically disappearing. And it all goes slow, but the rest of it, the authoritarian power which goes close to totalitarian, the cult of leadership, uh, the mobilized nation which is constantly preparing for the war or uh, participating in one, external enemies, internal enemies, the role of church which is enormous, mysticism, uh, denial of human rights as concept. I mean, it's all right there. So... The real question is, how did I notice it before? I mean, I was reporting for my country for 17 years. How did I notice that? And the true reason, I believe, 
the true reason I believe is that the love that gave me so much strength to keep going, it also gave me hope. And this hope blinded me. And it's sad to acknowledge, but it's important to do it. I can say when like I first when I finally realized that like when I couldn't deny anymore that we are fascists. Like it was like just a year before invasion, then I lived inside Pani, it's psychoneurological internet. It's like system of concentration camps, state run, state funded. It's a system of concentration camps for people with uh, psychiatric and neurological disabilities. There are like 177,000 people living in that place and 21,000 of them are kids. And both people living there without any right, any human rights, they cannot define any any small things about themselves, like the length of their hair, how long do we want to sleep, or what we're gonna eat, what we're gonna watch on TV. We don't have right for their own personal underwear. Most of them don't have teeth because they got no medical help. They never allowed to leave the place. They're gonna live there till they die. They for any kind for any negative emotion they expressing neg any negative emotions they can be and they are very often forcefully medicated and we don't even use know the name of medication what used against them. Women are being sterilized in these places like cats, and it's all happening like right now, and those people are living in such place right now. And these places are existing for a while. They were invented by Stalin after Second World War because we have a lot of mental disabled people on the streets after war. People got mad from the war. And these places existing this way since then without any change. And so when I realized it, I wrote a story. I mean, people got the word some nothing really changed it was a year before a year before full-scale invasion and i believe i should have done like next step like i read like in historic book that fascism always ended up ends up with war because it's ex it's like extensive ideology it's never like let's build nice cozy fascism inside our country it's always about extending. But somehow I didn't make this next step. And yes, I believe hope is the thing what actually grew inside me and changed my vision. Uh, how many people in this system? It is terrible. 177,000. Yeah. So to jump on, to jump on this question of hope and uh, what you were doing, um, I think there is one very important uh, aspect. Uh, uh, it's important for public discussion for me personally for for your life. Um, it's the LGBTQ question in Russia. You've been an activist. You are an open lesbian. Uh, you wrote about this and you did, you acted as an activist. Um, so could you please tell us a little bit about your experience uh, in Russia as a lesbian person, as an LGBT activist? Uh, because, you know, in the US, the context is, is different. And I think like people just would like to know uh, what exactly is happening in Russia, uh, how the state behaves in a certain way, uh, why it does so, right? Because now like the, what the state does and what like uh, sort of right-wing activists or pravoslavian activists, what they do is sometimes indistinguishable. Yeah, it's actually the same thing, right? And 
At the same time, you know, Russia is a fundamentally hypocritical state. Yeah, because there are people in the uh, sort of elites that are protected by the class or I don't know that they are kind of no one touches them, right? But the state attacks the most vulnerable people who are not protected by class, who are not protected by any sort of community uh, and no connections, right? So, yeah, so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about all this sort of cluster of issues, uh, sure. questions. Thank Thanks. you so much. Yeah, uh, I mean, I became LGBTQ activist because I was extremely naive, honestly, and because I have personal purpose on it. So I was like 21 years old, I felt a girl, and she loved me back. And in some point, I just, I was like super privileged, like Russia is huge and Russia is different. And in some parts of Russia, to be born as a lesbian, it's means like you're going to die and you're going to be murdered by your family. I mean, like North Caucasus mostly. Or you're going to be forced, if your family loves you much, you're going to be forcedly married on someone. Or probably some sense of exorcism going to be performed over you. They're going to beat you. They're going to starve you until you're going to get heterosexual. In some places, it's much more easier. I was privileged that I was always surrounded by people who basically didn't care that I'm a lesbian. And I never felt like I'm somehow discriminated. Till me and my girlfriend decided that we're going to buy a flat. We're going to take a mortgage. We both gone, we were from the other city and we wanted to buy a mortgage. And we, I called the bank because this bank had, had an advertisement that love is the only thing that matters. And um, a, uh, and they like don't really need uh, their families to be married for giving them a mortgage. And I'm like, yeah, cool. It's our choice. So I called them. And they were very, like, very polite to me, very happy that I called them. And I'm like, you have this advertisement? Yeah. And they said, yeah, sure. Like, so you don't need us to be married. This no, 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 no. Like, great. So what about us? We both work and we have a high education. Like, this is our common income. And she's like, oh, great. Let me call, uh, let me put your name in the manager's list. Okay, give, give me your names. So I gave them my names. And she says, excuse me? And I say, yeah, like, you know, like Elena Kostyshenko and Anna Aninkova. And she's like, that you're not a family. Like, family is like a man and woman. And this is a bank policy. And I'm like, whoa, bank policy. And then, then, then it just started to think what to, like, what to answer on that. Because, like, for me, it's like clear that family can be, like, whatever. Like, she just hang off on me and it's like it was first time when the bank worker hang off on me in my life and i'm like what the fuck and then i started to call other banks and uh, the response was quite the same and uh, in some point they one bank sent me okay we're gonna look at your profile but the uh, uh, mortgage rate gonna be like 19 percent and i'm like i'm sorry what and he said Oh, nobody gonna even look at your profile. You know, like you should be happy with us, ready to look your papers. Oh, I was so angry. Um, so when I just basically start to read about like like the marriage rights, like what it gives to me to get married, and then I start to read about LGBTQ activists in other countries and they start to look about our LGBTQ activists and I didn't really like them. They looked very weird. They wasn't really articulate and I'm like, oh, why are they protecting my rights so bad? They should do better work for that. I mean, my rights is not protected. And I was talking about it with my uh, best friend and she was listening to me like for a year when I was whining about LGBTQ activism in Russia and how sad and bad is it. And she didn't say a thing, but I got so ashamed every time I was saying that. And finally, I was like, okay, probably I should protect my rights. 
like I'm like grown up, probably I should be the one who like go for my right. So I decided to do it. And my girlfriend like supported me in that. So we went on a gay pride. It was my first gay pride. I was able to stand with a sign for like, um, I believe nine seconds. And then I got a uh, hit in my temple and what's it. Uh, and I keep repeating this thing because I mean, as you already know, I'm not a particularly smart person, but back then I was also extremely naive person. And I was thinking that it's so fucking obvious. I mean, like we are just like the other people. We just need to explain them. Like, look at us, like just the same, same face, same hands, same legs, uh, working, paying taxes, loving each other. It's like so natural that people are equal, like whatever. And I was thinking that it would be just enough for me to, you know, to go on the street to do my sign thing and like for five years and then I'm going to go get my marriage rights <laughs> and for five ne more years and I can get my parental rights. And well, I'm 30 and I'm ready to go pregnant and married and I have a mortgage. So yeah, this not really work out as you see. And I believe the first like openly uh, fascist law we had, it was the law against LGBT in 2013. Then they basically said that we are socially unequal. And then it was law got expanded since uh, full-scale invasion and also we have like the war situation on transgender people right now in russia basically uh trans uh, trans yeah basically gender transition is forbidden uh both like surgical both uh medical both uh, documents we don't change documents anymore as well if transition was in the past this person this person's marriage uh, doesn't exist anymore so state doesn't recognize this marriage uh, people got forcibly divorced and if a transgender person adopted kids these kids are being taken from them to uh, children care homes and those people got no medical support, no any human support. And they basically been provoked to suicide. And they named like perverts and state enemies and all the stuff. So it's like 750,000 people like that. And I recently get a chance to talk with some Congress people U.S. Congress people and uh, I was like begging them to evacuate as many people as they can because those people, I mean, they do deserve to leave and right now they basically cannot. And for me, I do understand why this gay thing and transgender thing, why is such an issue for our regime and it's not just about traditional values, though it's like a big point. But it's also about right of human being to rule his or her own life and his or in her own body. I mean, you cannot just mobilize people and send them to kill other people without their consent. I mean, like just to send to kill people or being killed. And same time, like, yeah, transgender rights are important. No, you deny both. So it's what we're doing. We make policy so people would understand that their bodies, their lives belong to state. And it's like a very clear point we try to make. Um, and unfortunately, it makes us inner enemies and I believe it's like another reason why we need us so badly because like the fascist works only if you have external enemies like Europe and USA and Ukraine and some other places but um, 
you need also inner enemies. And for inner enemies, LGBTQ are perfect. We are perfect. I mean, we look just the same, but we are so different. We are spread everywhere. We are hiding. I mean, it works. I mean, what other choice uh, could Putin do? He cannot play national card in Russia because we have so many nationalities. He Now he uh, tried to uh, do anti-Semitism, but didn't really work so well. I mean, it works awful. It Like pogroms had started in uh, Caucasus. Uh, but he needs somebody who's naturally an enemy. And here we are. So we like helping him, uh, like repressions on us, helping him building a nice cozy fascism, I believe. Thank you so much. Uh, we have hundreds of questions, but we decided to limit ourselves with only two questions, me and Nari, and now we are giving back power to Marcy and to audience to ask uh, more questions to Lena. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll just ask one or two and I'll turn it over to the audience. Um, so there's there's a very poignant and very sad chapter in the book where you tell the story of a conversation you have with your mother in 2014 when those, you know, those little green polite people show up in Crimea and and Elena's mother is a very important character in this book, and it's clearly a very important, very loving relationship. And Elena clearly feels very attached to and responsible for her mother. And her mother is is watching television in 2014, and is so joyful that you know Nash Krim, that you know Crimea has been returned to its home. Um, and Elena describes this conversation with her mother where she's screaming, don't you understand what's happening? Don't you understand that we have just you know, attacked an independent country? Don't you understand that there's going to be a war? And her mother doesn't understand. you know. And it's this kind of moment of, in the most intimate way, exposing these two radically different understandings of, of reality that are taking place. Um, and I, I've long been interested in these stories about split families because you have them now also across across the Russian Ukrainian border. There are many, many split families where you have your children in Ukraine who are being bombed and are calling their parents in Russia who don't understand and don't believe in them what's happening. Um, so I, I'd like to ask Elena to say a little bit about that and what what that what being so close to somebody who has, been so influenced by that narrative coming through on television has helped her understand about how Putin has been able to and how the Kremlin has been able to, you know, to capture so much of the population for this war. Well, propaganda. I mean, we have, I believe, an unprecedented propaganda right now in Russia. Like, Hebels could only dream about such kind of things that we have. It's very smart. It's very well-founded. When they say very well-founded, I mean $1.4 billion annually. And it's not just state media. It's also, like, Telegram channels. Uh, it's... Uh, we have spe uh, special organizations like Dialogue, which whole activities about producing fakes about war in Ukraine. And we have some troll factory and we have like propaganda recently came into schools right now. Children are obliged to attend lessons there. We taught about how Russia is great and that Ukraine as a state doesn't exist. But it all had started before full-scale invasion. Like I believe the like, like as I, as I mentioned that Putin started to control media, especially TV, which is crucial because the majority of Russians still use TV as the main source of information. It's like much less than like before the invasion, but still many of them. And it had started way before. 
I believe like the scariest thing when when I felt that it really went off is what like summer 2014 then me and my mom we decided to travel to Europe to Berlin we traveled to Berlin together and we was just walking on the street and at some point she stopped and looked at me and said you know how it's hard to be a mother of a traitor of a state and I'm, so, I'm sorry what she said you know for me it's hard to be a mother because you are the traitor of the state you traitor of Russia and I was so shocked I was like what do you mean she's like well you sold our country to Europeans and Americans for money and I'm like okay wait wait you know me well we have a close relationship I know how much money you have on your bank account you know how much money I have on my bank account and it's not like a big number I mean like no way is that a salary is per joke I mean it's true I mean so where are the money you said I sold it for money so where are the money and she had such a helpless look like she tries to you know to somehow make this picture work and it's not happening and she's like probably you sold it for free <laughs> because you are stupid but your colleagues are selling it for money and I'm like okay my colleagues who's like Pasha Kanegin, Liana Milashina, Olya Bobrova like you know my colleagues I mean you know those people you know how we live like they're poor as I am so where are the money and she's like, I don't know. And her face, I'm so angry on our propagandist. I believe those are people who I hate the most. And I really believe we should treat them as war criminals because they made this war possible. And they changed, we did so much talented smart work to change the souls and minds of my people and they use like the best feelings they use like the best feelings the love to our country the you know the feeling of justice the feeling of protecting the weakest but we also used two very important things, which I believe is like the seed of fascism. And one of them is resentment about Soviet Union, because the crash of Soviet Union became a moment of relief for many people, but also a tragedy for many others, especially because 90s were following. And 90s in Russia was like a terrible time, though here in West people used to look at it like time of freedom. It wasn't time of freedom at all. It was time of poverty, crime, and people has, they didn't feel they have any opportunity to influence politics. And they felt betrayed and lied to. And Putin just grew up from this time. I mean, he's just, the continuation of his 90s so people started to feel longing about soviet union and those feeling and also the idea that russia is great country and we are great people i mean we are not the only nation who believes that we are great nation on the great land great land right but it like opens the window of opportunity and unfortunately those this idea of greatness and feelings related to that and the longing about Soviet Union, which is also like a very real feeling for many people. Uh, we use them both to produce their propaganda narrative. And because this feeling are uh, most vividly uh, are most vivid in elder generation of Russians so they got affected the most and my mom my mom is amongst them 
and yes, Marcy, you're totally right. Like I know many broken families. I know many families that parents don't speak with children and children don't speak with parents. And brothers and sisters don't talk with each other. But me and my mom, we decided that we're going to talk no matter what. Because we love each other. And it's like the main thing. And this love became like a bridge. We're walking together. And it's not easy. Sometimes we scream on each other. Like really loud. And sometimes she just says, okay, now I cannot talk about it anymore. Or I can say the same. And we just stop for a while and then we continue. And I just want to say that for for me, it's as well challenging to understand her as backwards. Sometimes she's to tell me something and I'm like... You keep repeating TV, I hate it. And she's like, I'm not repeating anything. It's like my feelings, my thoughts. It's me. Just listen to me, please. And I understand that, like, it's from her side, willing to speak with me, willing to understand me, willing to understand what's really happening with our country. We both love tremendously. It's like a huge work. And not every person has enough resources for that kind of work. Okay, let me ask just one final question, then I'll turn it over to the audience. Um, so this is obviously, uh, this has been an understatement, a time of extraordinary difficulty for any Ukrainians and Russians to speak to one another at all. Um, and it's the first time I can remember where Russian thinkers, writers, intellectuals have not been you know, are being canceled, you know, a priori in in Ukraine. And and you were reporting in Ukraine at the beginning of the war um, as a Russian journalist, you know, very, like, very intimately involved, as you always are, with people who are experiencing the war, you know, and it, it was, it, it was your source in Ukrainian intelligence who called and warned you when you were being targeted for assassination. Um, and they were clearly trying to protect you. And so I, I I wanted to ask you to say a little bit about what it meant to be at the beginning of this invasion, a Russian journalist and openly a Russian journalist, working with Ukrainians, talking to Ukrainians, reporting on people who are being bombed, you know, and being shelled by Russians. Um, and what those relationships were like and and clearly you people did trust you um and i think that's uh, also an important story to tell at this moment thank you i get help from ukrainians since across the border like right away like then across the border it was second night of invasion uh, sanctions already was on and my card with money was blocked and uh, my phone stopped working as well because there was no roaming with uh, country of aggression and I just crossed the border and I was super like lucky privileged trusted that I could cross this border because also since the invasion Ukraine stopped accepting any Russian citizens and just my newspaper was able to contact it with uh, Zelensky office and explain them why it's important for me to be there and they let me in. I mean, it's like extraordinary. And then I crossed the border, it's like dark, cold, and I see like more than, I believe 2,000 people just standing very close to each other, waiting their turn to cross the border to Europe with all women and children. And I remember one woman with like very small baby, like probably three months old, like very small. And because there were people who were standing there for like hours, the length of turn was that moment, the length of line was that moment, like two days. And there was no place to, you know, to get warm. So this woman, she sat on the ground. She put her baby on her knees and she just basically closed with her body, the baby. And I see it all. 
and I'm like, it's hard for me to remember these days because like first month, first week, I had like a strongest feeling of the realization I ever had in my life. I just couldn't believe that it's all happening and it's all real. It's not like me who didn't want to believe, but it's like my brain was rejecting the reality of like really, really strong way. But I'm like, okay, I need to somehow keep going. And how would I do that? And I saw a man who was smoking and I approached him. We smoked together and I'm like, can you please give me some internet? I need to contact my news office and he's like okay where is your news office and I'm like Moscow and he just came there to put in that line two days line his wife with his son and he was about to come back to join the war and he's like okay sure so he gave me he gave me his internet and then he's like Okay, how you where are you gonna go? And I'm like Odessa first, but before that I need to go to Lviv so I can take a train. He's like, okay, how are you gonna go to Lviv? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I was hoping to catch some car. He's like, second day of war, nobody's stopping. And I'm like, okay, what should I do? He's like, well, you should walk twenty kilometers till Mastiska. It's like the closest, the closest. Uh, town and then you can try your luck there and I'm like okay so I better go so he took my bag from the ground and it was heavy bag it has like helmet and uh, bulletproof vest and you know some stuff and he put it on his shoulder and he's like okay let's go then and we walked all night he walked with me uh, he was he, twice we were standing in a huge line to like gas stations and he bought me some food because like I had no money and that kind of help it just continued people were helping me they were welcoming me in their houses they were sharing their experience with me and this experience was like both my kids are dead or I was helping women to approach the orphanage house and uh, Russian soldiers shoot our car and women I was helping a dad. Or it's like I live under occupation. And those people were willing to talk to me not because they liked me, but because they saw me as a chance to address Russians. We wanted for me to address Russians to explain them how they live, what's really happening. And some of them were willing to take risks of their lives for, for this opportunity. Because like those people who were helping me in occupied Kherson, I mean, I left occupied Kherson, but those people, I stayed under occupation and they knew that I put them like in danger with my writing, though it's way all anonymous, but still. And they were willing to do it. And people who were dragging me through front lines, through Russian checkpoints, it was like usual Ukrainians, we wanted to do it because we wanted to address Russians because they had such a huge, huge hope on our people, on us. We hope that then we understand what's happening. We would find a way and stop this war. That's why we did it. And I will never forget their trust and their hope on us. Even then, we were bombing them. So I'm very happy that I... But I was so privileged to meet all these people, to work with them. And it's something I will... I mean, I, I will just never forget because like it, yeah, I just stopped talking, I guess. Um, I mean, I would take some questions from the audience, um, but maybe I should take a few questions together or, yeah, Jacob, maybe I'll, I'll let you pass, um, I'll let you pass that around. 
Uh, Elena, hello. I'm. I would like to say thank you so much for everything you've done. I remember I discovered your uh, activity, you as a journalist, from Asa Kazan's very post of internet article. And I remember uh, when I was reading this article, I felt that you were so brave and you were so deep that you could describe um, this community, which represents very much um, the country of dictatorship, where all the human rights, like attitude to uh, the poorest and the weakest um, people or attitude to animals, like everything is disrespected. Everything which is respected is only power and violence. And um, so I'd like to ask, um, question related to Russians not in Russia, but maybe if, if you have uh, thought about Russians abroad. Because, because um, even after like full-scale invasion, when um, like Western world still perceives Russia, not through the eyes of uh, you when you looked at internet, but through Pushkin or Chekhov or Tchaikovsky or Dostoevsky, and they still wonder about this mysterious Russian soul, but they don't want to see what Russia really is. And Russia is in your work. Russia is in your text. Do you, have you thought like when they will see the reality and when Russians will like stop appropriating cultures of Ukraine and Georgians? in some way, because it's still like, uh, they, they they like to, to dance Gopak or uh, they like Hachapuri and they like to present it as a part of this huge imperial Russia when it's not. What are your thoughts about that? And thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your question. Ooh, what's my thoughts on that? Um, I believe that my book and my writing discovers just like part of Russia. Of course, it cannot be just be an ultimate portrait of my country. It's just my experience, my view is just people I was lucky to meet. And amongst them, there are like terrible horrors, like terrible life choices people doing, but also there are kindness and love and responsibility and it's all like very very mixed and I believe it's like what westerns might be called like mysterious Russian soul then something so high and so down so light and so dark is all mixed together and well but here I believe that even don't really different from other people uh it's just how we live uh, i mean how human nature works um but i see that somehow this war and the recent event like recent events like the catastrophic things what's happening like every day somehow became an opportunity to talk about like pushkin and dostoevsky and uh uh whatever i don't know why it's happening like for, for sure like we have so many other things to to be worried about but one of them you mentioned is definitely one of them is uh like colonialism and imperial ideas because we cannot see that behind this war that this war is basically it's continuation of soviet union fall I mean, like, right? Uh, the the whole these events, and not just this war, but some other conflicts which have been, you know, blown up for the last two years. And like that, sub, that is a like decolonization of Russia. It's the process which haven't even been start, started. I mean, and we need to do it. But the problem is that people who would do it most of them are abroad of russia and we don't have 
so much trust from Russians as we did when we were sharing their faith with them. I'm very excited to see how many uh, young decolonial activists from very different nationalities appeared for the last two years. And like those people, is their new generation. They not really work into this hierarchy of academics, which was denying the necessity of decolonization for like years. So I really hope for these people and I'm willing to be part of this process. But of course we should understand that this process is gonna be like long. And I probably won't see the end of it. <laughs> but why Western countries didn't see the true Russia? Well, I could blame them, but I haven't seen the true Russia as well as it seems like, right? I was shocked that they are full-scale invasion. Like, I, w I didn't expect it. I mean, I truly couldn't believe that Russian planes would bomb Kiev. I mean, I just couldn't believe that. I mean, I couldn't imagine it. And I believe everybody had their hopes, but also amongst hopes, there was some cynicism and willing to do business together, the good one, and also the uh, international habit uh, of impunity, then you can just, you know, invade some other country and capture its resources and people and nothing really going to happen and change the powers there and you know like it's what's happening on the world area and uh, putin was relying on that uh, habit of cynicism and impunity very much and so far it seems like he was right to rely on it but i also see that like this discussion is going on also since this full-scale invasion about do we really need real politics or do we want to reshape the rules and i hope it will be reshaped thank you so is it thank you so much for speaking to us and thank you for telling the truth um i think i have two parts for the question Probably just two questions, yeah. Um, and the first one is kind of one of the two quintessential qu questions in Russian history. And I think you tangentially, you touched upon this in your writings and today also. But I think it's just so, it's just so haunting for people in Ukraine, for people in Russia, and I think to some extent for people in the West. And the question is, Kto um, who is to blame? Um, and I think my other question, more on the human side, is how do you find hope right now um, in a world that is, and in the state that is so dehumanized and where even the purest sentiments are criminalized and are perverted? Thank you so much. I think I will start with hope. <sighs> well, I don't know when, when, where it gets from. It just, I believe it's some kind of, you know, chemical re reaction in my brain that produces, it is, is made by my body to keep me breathing. Um, so I don't really rule it. And I, I mean, if do we have some reasons for hope? Well, evil ends. And fascism, I hope it would be overcome. But the price world and specifically Ukraine pays for this is enormous. And Nobody can resurrect people who died. Nobody could continue the lives they lived. In.
I hope about my hopes. I hope that Russia will lose this war. It's the only way out for us to lose this war. Because if we win this war, God forbid, it means that without saying how many people we would kill we winning this war, right? But if we say about Russia, if we win this war, it means the fascism would grow stronger and stronger, and the next war would follow, and then the next war, and then the next war. And it's going to be endless nightmare, and it's going to be the end of the world, we know. And it's going to be the end of my country, for sure, and the end of my people, for sure. So I, I hope it won't happen. I hope Ukraine wins. I hope we will be able to change power in Russia because as I'm aware Ukrainians are not willing to go to Moscow to help us with Putin it's like our problem so we should solve it ourselves um, so yeah and I believe also the only real way to change this power would be revolution unfortunately I mean I saw some revolutions I hated it so bloody and it's disgusting most of the times but it's the only chance because okay we can hope for mysterious death of Putin I mean or like a coup uh, but coup is like a tricky thing if Prigozhin would gain the power we would miss Putin I mean he's I mean I mean he's a bloody maniac I mean, he has pictures of cut it head on his table, like work table. I mean, like we don't want this person as a president of a nuclear uh, superpower country. Like we just don't. And so the only hope for us is a revolution. And the revolution, it's like a stroke. You never know when you're going to get it, right? But we can make conditions. And... I believe it's what we should do. We should make conditions. We should we should help people who are in Russia and who are resisting. And there are such kind of people. I mean, it's just since the full-scale invasion, 20,000 people were detained for anti-war activities. 20,000 people. 50, uh, 500 of them uh, uh, were sent not into jails, but into prisons. And uh, like the, the prison terms are huge, like up to 15 years, and for journalists, maybe up to 25, like for Vladimir Karamursa. So people are resisting. Most of us, resistance is unpublic for obvious reasons. Uh, we have a lot of grassroots project, people who are not politicized yet, but who are willing to do uh, to do something useful. And just one of these projects through because was able to evacuate 50,000 Ukrainians from Russia to Europe. It's those Ukrainians who were uh, deported to Russia or uh, evacuated at some point in Russia. And those people didn't want to stay in Russia, so they were evacuated from Russia. And about how war sees the whole picture... So the way they evacuated all these Ukrainians is not working anymore because the last sanctions of European Union on uh, Russians cannot really cross the border of uh, European Union on their car. Well, it was the way how they evacuated people. And now we need to come up with something else. I'm sure we will. They are wonderful. But was it the goal of this decision to lock up Ukrainians into... Uh, Russia. No, I believe it wasn't. But the problem is that people who make in such kind of decision, they never consult with human rights defenders, uh, human rights organizations, grassroots movements, which we still have in Russia, about the possible consequences on sanctions. And it's not about like justifying what Russia is doing. It's just about 
picking the your ammunition wisely, right? We don't need those kinds of people face problems in their activities because of these sanctions. And yeah, so all these people give me a lot of hopes. And also like journalism. I mean, I just recently met Muratov, my former chief editor, chief editor of Nova Gazeta. And he said, you know, what's happening with Russian journalism? It's booming. And it is. I mean, though so many Russian journalists are exiled, so many Russian journalists, so many Russian medias are closed or shut down. In our profession right now, we have a massive number of very young reporters. And when I say very young, I mean it. It's like 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, who weren't reporters before full-scale invasion, but who came into profession right now in the darkest possible time. Then you can be sent like for 15 years in prison just for sharing some information about real information about Ukrainian war, war in Ukraine. So those people just jump into the profession right now and they're willing to do their work and they need some support and assistance and advices. Well, most of our advice is relevant right now. I mean, we never faced this kind of shit what we're facing right now, but they people are doing that and they remain in Russia. And amongst them is my younger sister who just joined uh, Nova Gazette investigative department. And I can be more proud of her and I can be more scared for her, but she's one of them. And she also gave me a lot of hope. So my hope is like my people and my pain is my people. So it's all very right. excellent. Um, let's take one more. Oh. Oh. Let's take one more question and then I'll let other people talk to um, uh, talk to Elena informally. Um, let's, uh, yeah, Shenya, can you stand up to make it easier for her? Yeah, um, I'm originally from Kherson, so your piece on Kherson was quite an emotional thing for me. And I want to thank you for this conversation tonight. You mentioned that love demands responsibility. And I just was thinking in terms of that in the context of like the situation where you described that there was like a man who was killed in the Donetsk and Lugansk vicinity. And then like his wife was like trying to find him, but she couldn't because Russia was denying everything. So my question is going to be about responsibility. So how do you see, can Russia break from this like vicious cycle of like constantly denying responsibility, denying the fact that like you have like people who, you know, might have also have some sort of like imperatives and things like that. Because I feel like one of the issues is like there's a constant denial of responsibility. And then the second part of the question, there is. I feel like when you ask in Ukraine, you know, or like abroad, like who is to blame, it's like either every single Russian is responsible for what's happening or it's, you know, it's only the Putin who is to blame. The people are just like, you know, they're being captive. But then like we can only say that this is only Putin because there are like 300,000 people in Ukraine actively killing Ukrainians. So, yeah, my question is, who do you think, where is, where is the responsibility? And also, what's your take on the collective guilt and like collective responsibility? Yeah. Thank you so much. These questions are so essential. Uh, and I cannot say I have answers, but I have some thoughts so I can share. I believe this vicious cycle you described and we don't take responsibility for what we're doing. It's like the key thing. It's just the key thing. And people somehow, we don't feel that they feel responsibility as a punishment. Well, it's not. It's just the category of adulthood. Like you're like responsible for things what belongs to you. And if your country belongs to you, you're responsible for that country and what this country is doing, right? You are responsible because it's yours. So that's simple as that. Uh, same about like the consequences of things you've done if you was the one who did it you are responsible right about the blame the guilt well it is different from the responsibility but so guilt i believe it's mostly a feeling and also I mean, the actual guilt is very connected 
with what people have done and what opportunities they have. For example, people in Pane Psychoneurological Internet is people who kept it there for their life term who has no human rights. I believe they are not they are less responsible and less guilty for what's happening right now, if they're guilty or responsible at all. Otherwise, me, who's like well educated, okay, quite well educated, but still uh, grown up, uh, physically okay person who was reporting uh, on my country uh, becoming a fascist country and didn't prevent a thing, well, I feel I am responsible and I'm guilty for much more. And no, unfortunately, Putin is not everything. I mean, I, I know that for many people it's very comforting thought. I wish I could believe the same. But it's not like fascism can grow by the efforts of one man. It doesn't work this way. And it grows inside people's hearts. So many hearts are infected. And I believe not all the people understand that the end of Putin not going to be the beginning of new Russia. It doesn't work this way. As well as the winning of Ukraine not going to be the end of Putin. So it's all like three separate goals and they should be performed by, by, one by one, but still they are separate. But for I understand why it's so challenging for many people to talk about it. Especially for families of, the, of those who were sent to Ukraine and killed people there and died there as a murderer on somebody else's land. I mean, then you lose someone you love and you have two competing narratives. One of them is that your beloved ones was a hero saving the lives of innocent people against fascist regime. And another one is that your beloved one died in shame and in vain and probably became a murderer of innocent people. Well, we know what thought is more comforting. And in in grief, it's very hard to find, you know, resources to proceed the second thought. But people are starting doing that. And I believe the major talk about responsibility and guilt and how it all works together and how it wasn't working for years. This major talks had started since this full-scale invasion. And I hope it will be continued and I hope we will be fruitful, not just, you know, let's talk about it and then just keep living our life. So I do hope we will have a chance to acknowledge our responsibility and to acknowledge our guilt because it's only way for us to, it's only hope for us for the future because without responsibility, we have no future. Hey, please. I know that there are many, many more questions. Um, I want to make sure Elena gets some food. She's still recovering from a poisoning operation in Germany. Um, and I'm very grateful that she has mobilized strength to talk to us all today. Um, please, thank you so much for coming. Please join me in thanking Elena and let's not lose hope. <laughs>